A starter Pokemon can mean a lot to a Pokemon player. It's the one they begin their adventure with after all. Unfortunately, the competitive Pokemon landscape doesn't really care about the heart of the cards or the innate power of bays or whatever. Contrary to my TikTok comment section, Torterra isn't going to carry you to a regional victory. But Game Freak does have a soft spot for some starters and made them top tiers in VGC. We'll be exploring the cream of the crop when it comes to starters today. So, I ask, what is the strongest starter Pokemon? If you enjoyed this video at any point in time, be sure to leave a like and subscribe for more competitive Pokemon content, because I'm on my way to 500,000 subscribers. As a matter of fact, you should subscribe right now, because I have a playlist full of videos just like this one that you can watch right after this. But first... Sponsor time. This channel is partnered with Gamersups. If you want to support my work and get great tasting drinks, you can order Gamersups through my link in the description down below or with code MOXIEBOOSTER at checkout for 10% off. Gamersups is a caffeinated product that I recommend only to my 18 plus viewers, but my link will send you to their caffeine free product section just in case. Every product purchased through my link supports my channel financially, so I'd really appreciate the support. Now back to the video. Thank you, Brian Hands. For this video, I won't exactly be ranking every starter Pokemon in order, but explaining the strengths of the starter and what niche it filled in VGC. However, as the list goes on, we will be trending more towards the stronger Pokemon on a team. Basically, this isn't in a specific order, but the weaker ones are first and the stronger ones are last. Also, I'll be sticking to the starters that actually had a niche in VGC, so no Meganium or Emboar. Sorry, comment section. Okay, let's begin with... Blaziken didn't exactly fill much of a niche without its mega form due to a fatal condition back in Gen 3 known as Mixed Attacker. Yeah, with a physical special split not yet implemented, Game Freak thought it'd be a good idea to have most of the Pokemon this gen be able to use whatever category of move they needed to. Blaziken especially needed this as a fire fighting type, since fire was a special type and fighting was a physical type. This didn't end up boding well for it in VGC, since when you make a Mixed Attacker, you end up lacking in other stats that you'll probably need, mainly speed. Luckily, as of Gen 5, Blaziken got access to speed boost, allowing for it to bypass this issue after a single turn. And in Gen 6, it got access to its Mega Form, which was where it was able to find a true niche. You see, Blaziken Bisharp was a duo which allowed for both Pokemon to make full use of their strengths. In Gen 7, Incineroar and Landris were the strongest Intimidators in the game, making Mega Blaziken's life a lot harder. Bisharp's ability in Defiant allowed for it to get plus to attack if any of its stats were lowered by the opposing Pokemon. By leading with Bisharp next to Blaziken, you could threaten major damage onto a Landris by going for plus one Sucker Punch, as well as an attack from the Mega Blaziken. As for Incineroar, even at minus one attack, it didn't enjoy eating a high jump kick from Mega Blaziken. While the duo wasn't huge, it certainly did exist, which is why it's on this video. <laughs> Similar to Blaziken, Superior didn't really have a niche in VGC until it got access to its hidden ability. Unfortunately for it, Superior didn't get access to its ability contrary until Generation 6. By looking at its stats, you can really see why it didn't see much success before this. But once it did get its ability, it became a pretty threatening boosting Pokemon by getting plus 2 special attack each time it used Leaf Storm. And no one believed in this Pokemon more than Jamie Boyd, who took it to several major events, including the 2018 Malmo Regional Championships, which he won, with a team of Superior, Alolan Persian, Celesteela, Mega Charizard X, Tapu Koko, and Suicune. The Superior ran a set of Wide Lens, Leaf Storm, Taunt, Swagger, and Protect. While Jamie did see success with the Snake, he was the exception rather than the rule. Swampert is yet another Gen 3 starter with a case of Mixed Attacker Syndrome. While its stats were certainly high and its typing was solid with Ground Water typing which made it only weak to grass, it wasn't that great of a Pokemon. This changed in Generation 6 when it got access to its Mega Form. With 150 base attack, 70 speed, and crazy good bulk, Mega Swampert could have easily been a major threat on its own, but what really gave it its viability was its new ability of Swift Sweat, which would allow for it to have double speed in the rain. Now, typically, this wouldn't be that great since the current best Swift Swimmer was Ludicolo, and that Pokemon could for lack of a better term, absolutely just annihilate Swampert, just really lay it on heavy with the grass moves, just absolutely decimate the dude. But this was fine, because you just run Mega Swampert with your own Ludicolo and a Pelipper who could threaten to KO a Ludicolo with Hurricane. Mega Swampert did see a decent amount of success, including multiple top cuts and a win at the Chile Special Event in 2018, being piloted by Felipe Mendez, whose team was composed of Mega Swampert, Ludicolo, Tapu Koko, Politoed, Scizor, and Tornadus. The Scizor was actually kind of a cool pick, considering the typical Steel-type partner for Swampert was Ferrothorn, who would easily wall opposing grass mons with the times for resistance. Empoleon won worlds once a really, really long time ago. Unlike the other fire starters on this list, Cinderace didn't start off weak and then find a role on teams later on, but it actually peaked pretty early in its career, then fell off really hard, similar to many famous soccer players. With the min-max stats of a modern starter Pokemon, it was able to be a strong physical attacker in the Dynamax formats of VGC 2020. With access to its ability Libero after the release of Pokemon Home, Cinderace was able to change its type every time it chose a new attack. In Dynamax metagames, this translated to, haha, stab max airstream, shake my hand, GG. Its G-Max form was eventually released as well, which 
simply allowed it to have access to Gmax Fireball, which is just a really strong fire max move with a built-in Mold Breaker. But while it did see success in Hyper Offense teams, it didn't exactly hold on to this success once Dynamax went away in Generation 9 VGC, where it's hardly seen. And while this Pokemon was strong in Gen 8, unfortunately the majority of Gen 8 took place during a global pandemic, so there were hardly any events for it to prove itself at. The highest placement I could find for it was 5th place at the Players' Cup 1, piloted by Christopher Khan on his team of Cinderace, Primarina, Togekiss, Incineroar, Ferrothorn, and Alolan Ninetales. <laughs> Seeing as Skeledurge and Miascarada haven't had a full generation to prove themselves yet, I figured it'd be best to tackle them both at once. Skeledurge is a bulky ghost fire type with access to the ability Unaware, which allowed for it to ignore the stat changes of opposing Pokemon when taking and dealing damage. Its only real niche in VGC 2023 was as a hard check to Dondozo teams. By using a terror type like Grass or Fairy, Skeledurge was able to combine its high special attack stat and great bulk and just straight up ignorance to wall out Dondozo and eventually KO it with Shadow Ball. Afterwards, it would recover off any damage it took with Slack Off. Uh, Eventually, people realized that you could just use Meowskarada instead. As a matter of fact, Meowskarada is a powerful, fast physical attacker with access to the ability Protean. Not that it ever used it though, since the ability was nerfed in Generation 9 to activate only once every time the Pokemon hits the field. Due to this and its tendency to run Focus Sash, it would often just run Overgrow instead. This ability grants it a 50% boost to grass moves when it's at one third health or lower. Its true draw though was its signature move, a Flower Trick. This 70 base power physical grass move bypasses accuracy checks and always lands a critical hit, meaning it'd be a clean one or two shot on any any Dondozo barring Terra Grass or Flying. Eventually, once Paradox Pokemon like Fluttermane were introduced, Meowskarada fell off in usage. It became pretty scarce with the introduction of Rillaboom back in Generation 9, giving it competition that it just couldn't beat. As a bulky water and fairy type, Primarina had a lot going for it from the get-go. I mean, with Tapu Fini and Azumarill's track record, we can only assume that this thing's gotta be decent too, right? Well, it's actually pretty interesting just how viable Primarina is while still being outclassed by Tapu Fini. Primarina has some pretty great stats at 126 special attack, 80 HP, and 116 special defense. Offensively, it's hard to match, especially once it got access to its signature ability of Liquid Voice, which turns all sound-based moves into water type attacks. While this is mainly used to turn Hyper Voice into a no-drawback clone of Surf that bypasses Substitute, it also has one one other pretty neat use. Primarina turns Pear Song into a water type move, meaning any Pokemon with Dry Skin, Water Absorb, or Storm Drain will have their ability activated and thus be immune to the effects of Pear Song. So let's say you have a Toxicroak on the field with a bit of chip damage and a Focus Sash next to a Primarina. If you go for that Pear Song, that turn the Toxicroak will have its health restored and thus its Focus Sash restored, rather than having Pear Song activate on it. This wasn't a huge reason to run Primarina, but I thought it'd be neat to mention. While Primarina was a strong offensive water fairy type, it was outclassed by Tapu Fini. Not offensively, but just as a general Pokemon to fill the bulky water fairy role. More teams would prefer having Misty Train active to block spores and thunder waves after all. This is why Primarina was used often, but only in formats where Tapu Fini wasn't available, like Series 5 VGC in Generation 8. Its highest placement was a second place finish at the Players' Cup 1 on G-Sock Lee's team, which consisted of Primarina, Incineroar, Dragapult, Ferrothorn, Clefairy, and Urshifu Single Strike. Really, as long as Tapu Fini isn't in the picture, people will have plenty of reason to gravitate towards Primarina. Here's where we really get into the upper echelon of starter Pokemon. Ranking these top four is really hard, but I think I got them in the right order here. Venusaur is historically one of the strongest starter Pokemon of all time. Despite its stats being super average, Venusaur has been able to stay relevant in VGC due to its many forms granted to it each generation, as well as the ability Chlorophyll combined with its great offensive tools. 100 special attack and 80 speed may not be the greatest for an offensive Pokemon, but players gravitate towards it due to its ability to sleep the opposing team with Sleep Powder coming off of an effective 290 speed set if the sun is active. Once the threatening Pokemon Pokemon is out of commission, Venusaur has a massive burst damage option in Leaf Storm or even a fire type Weather Ball to chunk steel, ice, or other grass types. Venusaur saw heavy play in restricted formats next to Primal Groudon due to its positive matchup into other Groudon and Kyogre. Its strength in VGC got even better with Dynamax, which granted Venusaur its own G-Max form and Max move. G-Max Vine Lash was one of the strongest moves in the game, dealing massive damage off the initial hit, then dealing residual damage to the opposing side of the field to the tune of 1 6 of the target's health for 4 turns, as long as the Pokemon active wasn't a grass type. This combination of tools allowed for Venusaur sort of sleep the opposing Dynamax Pokemon, possibly shutting it down for all three turns of its max, then retaliate with its broken grass move and coverage options like Max Quake or Flare. Venusaur saw great results, too many to mention in fact, but some tournament wins under its belt include first place at the 2022 North America Internationals by James Evans, the 2018 Anaheim Regionals by Raghav Malavia, and the 2019 Dallas Regionals by Nick Navar. I'm honestly really invested to see just how strong it is in Gen 9 BGC once it returns in the DLC.
Besides Pikachu, Charizard is Pokemon's poster child. It receives endless buffs in the form of Mega Evolutions and a GMAX form, and tons of moves that just keep it relevant no matter what. Charizard has some decent offensive stats at 109 Special Attack and 100 Speed. While offensively this is just serviceable enough, its fire and flying type in a format where Rock Slide is clicked 40 times each game isn't very good. Due to this, in Generation 6 it received two Mega Evolutions which granted it much greater viability. Zard X shedded its flying type for a Dragon type and gained an increase to both of its offensive stats to get them up to 130. While both stats were equal, you were incentivized to use the physical set due to its ability Tough Claws. This ability would boost the power of all contact moves by 30%. This means that an already powerful Flare Blitz would become an insane 156 base power before accounting for stat, and Dragon Claw would also become 104 base power, meaning that what typically would feel like a wet noodle of a move would easily take a chunk out of any Pokemon's health. Meanwhile, Charizard Y would keep its old typing, but its special attack would skyrocket to 159, and it would gain the ability of Drought, boosting the power of any fire moves by 50%. Taking a Heat Wave or Overheat from this thing wasn't an easy task as even Assault Vested Pokemon could expect to be taken to red health. The Sun Active also allowed for the likes of Chlorophyll Partner Pokemon like Venusaur to spam Sleep Powder next to it, and the decrease of power of water moves didn't hurt Charizard either since it was weak to those. Both forms of Charizard saw heavy usage on differing teams, and the closed team sheet era of Pokemon meant that it wasn't always easy to tell which form of Charizard was being run by the opponent. Even when its Mega Form wasn't legal, Charizard did perform pretty well on Sun teams due to its ability Solar Power, which granted a 50% boost to its special moves as long as the Sun was active at the cost of some health at the end of each turn. Speaking of Solar Power Charizard, its GMAX form took full advantage of this ability to decimate entire teams in the Dynamax format of Generation 8. GMAX Wildfire was the signature move of GMAX Charizard, and it functioned the exact same way as Venusaur's GMAX move by dealing one-sixth of the opponent's health and damage for four turns, only this time the only Pokemon immune to this were fire types. GMAX Charizard was the most dominant Dynamax Pokemon in several formats due to its ability to one-shot with Max Wildfire in the Sun, and its ability to pair well with Venusaur and Groudon, and even its ability to sponge hits from opposing Zacian due to its fire typing. Scrolling Charizard's results screen on Limitless VGC brings pages of results just from Generation 8 including second place at the Pokemon World Championships by Guillermo Castilla. While Rillaboom hasn't had the same amount of time to prove itself in VGC as the other starters, it certainly cemented itself as one of the greatest Pokemon of all time, simply due to its ability Grassy Surge. Honestly, it seems like Grassy Surge could carry any grass type to relevancy, but it takes a lot to dethrone a Pokemon like Tapu Bulu from its niche. Rillaboom may not have as good bulk or attack as Tapu Bulu, but it makes up for this in its sheer utility. Rillaboom has access to Fake Out, Knock Off, Taunt, U-Turn, Drum Beating, and most importantly, Grassy Glide. This move was the main reason Rillaboom became such a staple of VGC teams in Generation 8 and remained a powerful option in Gen 9. Grassy Glide was released in the Isle of Armor DLC back in Gen 8 as a 70 base power physical grass type move that gained priority as long as Grassy Terrain was active. This meant that Rillaboom could threaten to one-shot the likes of Kyogre or Urshifu Rapid Strike despite being outsped by both of them. These traits allowed for Rillaboom to slot in as a grass type on plenty of teams, and it's one of the starters with the most tournament wins under its belt despite the lack of time in the competitive scene, including a win at Players Cup 1 by Santino Tarquinio, Players Cup 2 by Wolf Glick, the 2022 Bilbao Special Event by Jonah Weigel, the 2022 Indianapolis Regionals by Stefan Mott, the 2022 Perth Regionals by Alistair Sandover, the 2022 Secaucus Regionals by Emilio Forb, and the 2022 World Championships by Eduardo Kuna. It's also got plenty of top 8 results in 2023, but we'd be here all day, and we really need time to talk about the GOAT. Honestly, if you didn't see this coming, you've probably never even heard about VGC. While Incineroar started off life as an okay pick in VGC due to its good typing and access to tools like Fake Out and U-Turn, it was basically a ticking time bomb until its hidden ability dropped in 2018. As a matter of fact, the impact of Intimidate Incineroar's release was so huge that many people consider VGC 2018 pre and post Intimidate Incineroar to be two completely different formats. Incineroar's already powerful tool set of Fake Out, U-Turn, Knock Off, Snarl, and Flare Blitz was taken into the stratosphere of viability once it gained Intimidate due to its ability to pivot in and out of the battlefield. This would lower the damage output from the opposing team, thus supporting its own team by increasing their longevity. Incinera Splash ability was insane. It was practically on every team from 2018 onward if you were serious about winning. And this isn't because it was truly overpowered, but rather a Swiss army knife of a Pokemon. Oh, I want to stop Trick Room? I'll run Taunt on it. Oh, I want to prevent Snorlax from belly drumming? I'll run Snatch. This one worlds, by the way. Oh, I want to stop Geomancy Xerneas? I'll run Roar. Oh, I want to stop Kyogre from sweeping my entire team? Well, buddy, there's a berry that lets Incinera live a water spout. Isn't that kind of crazy? Point is, Incineroar could fit basically anywhere, and many players would hesitate to call it overpowered despite this. An overpowered Pokemon is something like Urshifu, which necessitates its usage due to its lack of counters. Incineroar, on the other hand, had counters. It was just so reliable that you didn't mind it. No one has ever said, oh, I would have won if my opponent didn't have Incineroar, because it was just like clicking fake out in Snarl and stuff. Incineroar's viability only got higher once it gained access to Parting Shot in Generation 8. For what reason, I'm not sure, but they thought it needed the buff. But now it could run this 
move over U-turn to further reduce damage from the opposing Pokemon while also pivoting out. So basically, you could lead Incineroar, Intimidate, Parting Shot out, and bring it back in all in the same turn as long as you had a slower U-turn partner next to it. This would bring a physical attacker down to minus three attack in a single turn. It's just that good. Incineroar honestly has had a long history in Pokemon despite being relatively new due to its viability, and it has more titles under its belt than any other starter, so it's truly not even competition if this is the strongest one. I mean, it was a counter to Calyrex Shadow in Zacian purely due to its ability and typing, and that's why it's taking the number one spot on this kind of sort of list slash ranking video. But those were the strongest starter Pokemon. Like I said, I didn't include starters. I really didn't see having much viability anywhere since I'd basically just be naming them and then moving on. Kind of like Empoleon, who's only on this video because of its one hit wonder performance. But let me know what you thought about this video in the comment section below and be sure to leave a like and subscribe to support the channel. I've got tons of content coming up on the end screen in a playlist for you to enjoy. Thanks to my Patreon supporters and channel members for their support and a special thank you to my most boosted supporters, Avatar67, Kanor, Joseph B, Narwiz, and Pokemace for their generous pledges. If you want to see your name at the end of my videos and gain access to bonus content each week, be sure to check out my Patreon page in the description down below, or click the join button below the video to become a channel member. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video. Bye!